Hey there, everyone, uh, friends, frenemies. Anybody interested in writing on Sunday morning? I welcome you all. And if you're watching the replay, well, I hope you're going to enjoy this as well. If you're new to these, the concept is super simple. I write a blog post. I do it live. You can watch me as I go. I make a lot of typos. I do a lot of chit chat. The aim is for it to be just a very relaxed sort of coffee shop-esque vibe. Um, I, I never know what I'm going to write about. Sometimes I have an idea in mind, but today I'm just going to wing it see what happens and you can come with me on that journey. If you've got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I normally like will write a little bit and then take some breaks to answer questions. And yeah, if you want to write alongside, have a little bit of a convivial sort of co-writing atmosphere, definitely feel free. I've got my hot beverage ready. I just had my breakfast, so I'm going to dive right in and start writing. Um, how's everyone doing? Where, where are y'all from? I can see couple of people live. I'm based just outside Atlanta, down south. I'm just getting my medium up. Do, 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 do. Humming to myself. I've been watching a lot of um, Netflix kept recommending this TV show Virgin River to me. So I, I, I don't know, it's kind of made me feel nostalgic for um, like going to a new town and kind of I don't know if any of you have ever moved, but when you know when you go to a new town and there are sort of weird local traditions, it's kind of made me um, nostalgic for those times. Maybe I'll write about that. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully you will now be able to see an MD draft that I have. All right. Hi everyone. I can see Ola, Araventh, uh, Gio T. Minajo, Kevin, the Bejesus. Friends and Emotion films all popping in the chat. Great to see you all as well. Um, I would love to know what do you all do when I write? Like I like to imagine that we're all just kind of typing away together. Like it's almost like a cafe, but not really. Um, but I, I would be really interested to hear what you guys do, or if you just watch me type and you know make fun of my typos to yourself. I don't know. Yeah, tell me what y'all get up to when I'm doing this. I'd love to know. All right, gonna start writing. Hmm, title. <sighs> okay, so what a lot of you might not know is that I went to college in Oxford, Oxford in, in the UK. I uh, went over there to do my undergraduate studying biology and um, I met the love of my life there. We're, we're married now actually. And um, yeah, Oxford was a lot of fun, uh, really weird too because because it's been a school, like a university for so long, the whole town was Oxford University. Like people live there who didn't attend there, but the, the university was the soul of Oxford town. And it had a lot of weird traditions, and a lot of weird stuff. Maybe I'll write about that. Like, because uh, I am feeling a little homesick for like fresh beginnings and stuff. Um, what it was like, oh, the university. Oxford as an American. Capitalize the I, I think so. I think so. All right. I'm just going to start brainstorming weird stuff. I do know the Ashmolean. Um, I used to go sometimes like for fun just to walk around because uh, it was free because I was a student um, but we had a really nice lunch there uh, after I graduated we my my family came over to visit for my graduation and my at the time my boyfriend came over and his family were it was a really really lovely lunch um, okay well, let's make this a listicle the 10 weirdest things about attending the all right that's a little that's a little clunky but we'll, we'll get there we'll get there hmm okay so some of the weirdest things okay okay i'll start from the beginning um when i first got in we got all this like email stuff that was always referring to this random things like subfuge we thought it was called um it's actually pronounced subfusk and it it refers to the uniform you have to wear i wonder if i can find a picture of it um, Fusk. When we went to Oxford, 
we had to wear this like these uniforms whenever we took exams. So very formal setting. <laughs> that was so funny. And we had to sit collections. Those were collections were like what like they didn't count for a grade. They were just a way for your tutors, uh, which I'll talk about also, your tutors to kind of make sure that you had studied over the holidays, basically. That's Holy and Trinity term. And the terms were called weird. So from October to December, because it wasn't semesters, it was terms, trimesters, really. So we had from October to December was Michaelmas, then January to March was Hillary, and then April to June was um, Trinity term. What else? What other weird stuff? College parents. So uh, if you went to an American university, the concept's probably pretty similar to like littles and bigs and sororities. Um, at the Jesus colleges, oh yeah, I need to talk about college system, like Harry Potter. Yeah, you had like, oh yeah, hang on, I'm getting trashed. I had to write this down before I forget. Um, so when you when you went to a college, you got assigned a pair of college parents who were um, two or sometimes three students a year or two above you, and they would kind of like look after you. And um, and the person who was your college parent, you would end up like having some kind of romantic relationship. And this happened so often that there was like a little catchphrase for it. It was like incest, incest which is super gross, um, but that is how I met my now husband. So there's some truth to it. Um, the college system was like Harry Potter. So you apply to Oxford. You don't just apply to the university, you apply to like a specific college at the university. So I applied to Balliol, but I got pulled to Jesus College, which was founded in like the 1500s when it was cool to just call things Jesus College, even though they're not religious at all. Welsh college. Mm, do I want to talk about that? Nah, maybe not. Maybe a little too weird. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What else do we got? Um, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll come, I'll come do some questions while I brainstorm. Um, let's see. Hi to Kevin from Phoenix, uh, the Bajesus from Ireland. Joe T. Minajo about to go to sleep. Paul Smith drinking beer. <laughs> Kevin's actually working on his NaNoWriMo, um, which I I wanted to do that, but then after all the election confusion, I was like, I can't I can't dedicate time to both of these projects. And keeping up with Twitter was a whole full time project at the time. Um, half uh, half your attention is a good bargain, I think, if you're also doing NaNoWriMo. Um, let's see. A Motion Films wants to know if there was Quidditch. There was. It wasn't like magic Quidditch, but there was, there was actually Quidditch at Oxford Uni. Um, so this is so embarrassing. I never did this, but people did run around. Like, it was a thing. People played Muggle Quidditch. Oh, good times. All right. Uh, what else, what else, what else, what else, what else, what else? Ooh, punting. That wasn't specific to Oxford, but it was kind of specific to UK college. Punting was, you went on the river Isis, which it's the name of a Greek god, so it's allowed. Um, this was before the whole Isis thing. Um, and you would, you would like, you would buy this very, you would rent this very long boat and you would sort of pull yourself around. Mm, rowing was such a big deal. I rowed for two years and I hated both years of it. I don't know why I kept going even when I hated it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, two more. Two more people. Um, so my college had a very specific um, tradition that have I talked about getting trashed? Oh yeah, so whenever you sat exams, you would sit them and then you would have to come back um, to your college and basically get celebrated by the college. So you and your sort of, the people who did the same degree as you would come back to college 
and people would like throw water at you, which sounds violent and aggressive, but it was actually a really sweet tradition. So people would like throw water at you, and some colleges did like silly string and glitter and stuff like that. Um, so you were you got trashed, and it didn't mean to get like drunk trashed, although you, you did that too. But you know you would get trashed, and um, at, at my specific so all colleges got trashed, but my specific college, you there was a big clock in the quad. And you had to, your friends would buy you a bottle of like really cheap champagne and you'd shake it up and then you would you'd try to pop the cork off so it would hit the clock. And if you hit the clock, the, the local folklore was that you would get a first, which was a really high mark, a really high grade to get. Uh, hitting the clock. All right, how many are we up to? I feel like I've counted 10 times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. All right, let's jump in and actually start writing now. Mm, all right, I might I might take the University of. I don't want to say my actual teacher's name, Miss. Oh, we'll call her Miss Peterson. I don't know if non plus thinks means what I think it means. I, I thought it meant like casual, like sure. I mean, I'm gonna Google that though. Non plus. Okay, yeah, no, that fits. changing that because I don't want to start both paragraphs with when. I feel like that's a little not that great. Uh, all right. So letting myself in for. Is that a thing people say? Like letting myself in for some weird stuff. I feel like it is. Okay, we'll come back to that. Throughout my three years there, I got, oh, secret societies. I was in a society at Oxford. <laughs> oh, secret. There are very, very secret societies, and I was part of like a not so secret society, but I had the existence of some very secret societies. 
which made me feel really special as a kid. <laughs> uh, all right, we can shorten this. I had just finished a physics test. I actually, as a result of my six years in the UK, I can actually do a pretty good British accent. It comes off very posh because like basically everyone there spoke the Queen's English. Um, I'm not gonna do it now because now I feel like I've put too much pressure on myself and I will do a really bad one. So I'm just not gonna do it. You'll just have to take my word for it. I'm very good at doing a fake British accent. I fell in love, fell in the river and fell What's another thing you can fall into? Fell into a bush. I did do that actually on a night out. But I don't want to fall into a bush and a river. And fell into the river. It was an amazing, exciting, terrifying, and very strange time in my life, all the more so because I had no idea what to expect. All right. Mm, 10 weirdest things about attending. University of Oxford. So I think I've mentioned this on some other live streams. When I don't know if my title is too long, sometimes I like pretend to go publish it. And this shows me what it would look like, like if I went to Medium right now. And like, okay, so it's not too long. It's actually not, not bad at all. So, what are the weirdest things about? I don't love that title. I just don't. Okay, I got trashed. Mm. Oh, mess and I miss first week. Came and spell University of Oxford. Just goes to show you how you don't need to be a good speller to get into the college. I fell in love. I feel like there's another thing you can fall into. I want to do a triple thing. Fit. Catherine's got a not bad idea suggestion of fell into some crazy circumstances. I want something more specific. Like I did fall in love. I did fall into a river. Fall into love that. I might have to get rid of that, which is annoying because I really like the fall in love, fall into the river sort of dichotomy we got there. All right. One. Yeah, let's make all these bold. You have to sit exams in something called ah, sub. Now, was it one word or two? I thought it was two. Sub -fusk.
Oxford and I used to heartily believe in the power of taking important tests in sweatpants. Comfortable, breathable, and allow you to hyperventilate very quietly. That was before I took or sat in the local parlance exams at Oxford. Due to, why do we? I don't even remember why we did it. Because, ah, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Oxford is such a weird and old university. It has tons of leftover and frankly meaningless traditions. One of which was being forced to wear formal wear and a gown to exams, print, principles, collections, and graduation. A formal wear outfit. Insert on the picture. I'm gonna go through my Facebook later and pull up some old pictures of me uh, getting trashed and uh, in my old subfusk. I still have my mortarboard somewhere. You were allowed to wear your mortarboard or you could wear what was called the soft cap. There it is, okay. Uh, which was like a straw hat, Oxford soft cap. You'll see what I mean in a sec. Hang on, where, where's the soft cap? This weird one, like a weird Walters. That's where everyone bought their, their like, you had to wear like a little tie. Oh God, the velvet ribbons, still got nightmares. Oh, and you had to wear, oh, I'm gonna have to put that in. Uh, rowing. It was also traditional and lucky to wear to pin a carnation. So you would pin a white carnation to the first day of exams. You would have a pink carnation for your second through N minus one exams. And your final exam would be sat in a red carnation. And that's how everyone knew what stage you were at of your examination. If you were just starting or if you were fighting through to the end. And um, I, the most exams I ever had to sit in one go was just four. So I had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday exams. So my pink carnation was fine for two days. But some people, like the classics, people who study classics, have two whole weeks of exams. Two whole weeks. So they'd have to purchase like multiple pink carnations to pin through. Pin a carnation to your subfusk. It was very unlucky by your own. You'd typically form an agreement with friends to buy each other's carnations for exams. They called it the exam school. Exam school, Oxford. God, I'm getting heart palpitations. It was such a pretty town. I loved it. Uh, all right.
All right, break for questions. Catherine, I love that suggestion of um, fell into a British accent. Fell, uh, fell into the habit of speaking with a British accent and fell into the river. Only I could spell. Okay. Um, let's see. Ola asks, what do you do if your article wasn't accepted? Do you submit it to other publications or self-publish or publish in your own publication? Right. So I used to be very impatient and I used to just self-publish. I hate waiting for publications to get back to me. Nowadays, I submit to one, maybe two. So for example, um, I submitted an article to The Ascent a couple of days ago. They never got back to me. So I was like, I'm not going to wait a week. So I took it out submitted it to Mind Cafe and they published it the next day. I will probably never submit to more than two. If I get rejected from two publications, I'll typically publish it in my own publication. I recently started doing this. I didn't used to have my own publication, Zuli Writes, but now like this, I'm gonna put in Zuli Writes because I think nobody else wants my listicle of <laughs> weird stuff I experienced at, at Oxford. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what I do. I used to self-publish, but now I think it's good to have a collection of all my own stories in my own publication. Uh, what publications are great for relationship articles besides P.S. I Love You? So I've seen this publication called Hello Love going around a lot. Um, Hello Love Medium. Yeah, this one, um, which seems to have be kind of like a, a competitor. P.S. I love you, if I will. Um, I've seen some popular, like popular on Medium stories come from Hello Love. Let's see. So that's that's who I, oh, it's done by the Good Men Project. Interesting. Fascinating. Okay, so that would be my recommendation for that. Um, oh, uh, in case you didn't see, Ola Franz recommends Athena. When writing an article, where do I get my ideas to write? So, my number one place for inspiration is Twitter. Uh, I wish I was joking. I spend way too much time on Twitter and the result is I um, randomly get inspired when I see cool trends or just random tweets that I'm like, huh, I have my own take on that. Um, and then that, sorry, I just spotted a typo. Um, and that lets me just collect a bunch of drafts. So I have like, I forget how many drafts I have. I've got two, over 200 drafts. Um, and they're all like, I could turn any one of these into a story if I wanted to. Like, look at this one. How to establish healthy boundaries with your cat. I think I think I will one day turn that into a story because I think the concept is very funny as a cat owner. I may be biased, but um, so yeah, I see stuff on Twitter typically and then I just whack it into my drafts folder. Even if the only idea I have is like a headline, or like I saw this, I saw this article and I was like, I think I could turn that into a story. So I just, I put the, the article in there and then a random headline so I know what I'm talking about. So that's how I get story ideas. When I'm actually inside writing them, it kind of just flows. If I ever don't know what to write about next, I'll read the whole thing aloud. And normally that prompts a couple things to flow. So like, I, you, I don't know if you were here when I started drafting this, I just came up with a bunch of like I came up with my title first and then I was like, all right, weird stuff that happened to me at Oxford. And then I just sort of took a walk through memory lane, like what was all the weird stuff? So the sub fusk, weird, collections, weird, tutors. Tutors were actually pretty cool. Um, so, and then this, I'll be surprised actually if on writing these, I don't change these more as I go because some of these I can probably consolidate into one. Some of them will sprout their own ideas, et cetera. Uh, always got another question. What small or medium sized publications worth trying to get into? It depends a lot on your topic. So if you like writing humor, I don't even know if I would consider this a small one, but humor, satire, anything like that, highly, highly recommend um, Jane Austen's Waste Basket. Waste, I can't spell Waste Basket. Uh, uh, I typically see these stories get a pretty high engagement rate. And I know the editor, I recommend her publication or her stuff all the time because I know that she's very, very consistent with managing this publication. 
So that's one for, for satire, humor, even some fiction, I think. More than specific recommendations, what I would say is look for publications that are well, well managed and well looked after. So two more examples are Storius Mag. That's anything to do with marketing or writing. It's a small publication, but again, the editor is very consistent and very caring and very thorough when it comes to trying to grow his publication. Um, Creatures by, I think it's Darby. I always want to say Darcy, but I'm pretty sure it's Darby. Um, that's about animals and pets and anything to do with creatures. Again, small, but growing because she takes such care in curating and editing and just making sure that her articles in her publication are well looked after, marketed appropriately, etc. So um, yeah, probably to, I can't get too many specific recommendations because, you know, there are, I don't, I don't even know how many thousands of publications, but I would just recommend being on the lookout for publications that have a good editor at the helm. Um, how many stories do I have on the go at any given time? I usually try to stick to one. Um, the only exception is if I am like in the middle of this one and I'm like, oh, I've just been struck with an idea of why collections are important. This should be its own article. Then I'll put that there and I might, I might do them simultaneously because they're kind of analogous. Other than that, I normally try to focus on one at a time. I get it distracted very easily. And if I let myself do too many things at once, all the articles I'm working on will turn out to be crap. So that's why I, I tend to focus on just one, write it, edit it, publish it, whack it off then move on to the next one. Do writers have to use advanced words or phrases to be a good writer? No, you don't. Um, I don't think I have a particularly advanced style. I know others who do have a very academic style, but what I think you should remember, especially on Medium, is that nobody is reading to, well, some people are learning to reading to get a better vocabulary. A lot of people here are just reading to learn something new, to be entertained, to have a perspective shift. Like, I don't think people are reading this because they admire my academic writing. I think they're reading this because they want to travel the world as much as they're able in these trips. So um, I, I don't think you need advanced words or phrases to be a good writer. I think you just need to write in a way that reaches people. And that doesn't have to be from, from advanced words or phrases. That just has to be from wielding language as best as you know how. Sorry, that's not a very good answer. Short answer, no, you don't. Um, but Jesus, if I decide or you decide to start your own publication later, can you move some of your articles into it or republish? I did this and I moved them into it. I actually, I would not recommend this because I feel like it was shady of me. I took articles out of publications. Like I took some out of the Ascent and put them in my own publication. If I were to do that again, I wouldn't. Um, I would just put the ones that were unpublic, were not in a publication and move them into my new pub. I wouldn't republish. Medium is a little persnickety about what they allow to be republished. Um, they have a very strict no duplicate content rule. So unless you're gonna th seriously edit and sort of reformat, I would not recommend republishing. I would just move anything that doesn't already live in a pub. All right. Let's carry on right. I wanna try to, I'm gonna try to get, a, get like two chunks done.
only your exams actually counted towards your final grade, your exams and sometimes some coursework, which was very high stress. So I forgot about this. So I don't know if any of you are British, maybe this is typical for British universities, but at Oxford, I did not, nothing I did in my first year counted towards my final grade. I sat exams at the end and I, I passed those and then that was it for first year, the pass. And the pass or fail didn't even come with me. That was just to determine if I was allowed to stay basically. <laughs> Um, and then second year, I sat exams and did a bit of coursework, um, and that was worth, I think, 30% of my final university grade. And then third year, I sat more exams and did some more coursework. Uh, I had to do like an oral presentation, and I had to write up a big um, thesis. So that was the other 70%. So I think coursework, coursework was 30%, and exams were 70%, but all in the last two years. Like the first year didn't count for anything. It was basically pass-fail. Oh. Oh, okay, Sophie's just confirmed as a Brit who went to university. Um, first year doesn't normally count. So very different from American university. My little sister went to um, a college here in the States and like there's tests very frequently, projects you got to do, coursework, quizzes, homework, all that stuff counts. So I can never decide which one I like better. Like I think the system of putting everything at in a one week period at the end of one or two years is kind of stressful, but also I think it's stupid to have to do stuff that counts for a grade all the time. So probably neither are great. Not so word. Ah, that's not right. Opposite. That's the word I'm looking for. Go wrong in this case. See, sometimes like I know I didn't finish the above paragraph, but I also want to keep moving forward. So I'm like, all right, I'll just leave that and I'll move on while I can remember and then I'll come back. Uh, let me feel a little annoyed when my friends. I can, I can tighten that. My friends thought I was very lucky to have six weeks to have a six week break for Christmas, but, but they didn't see me 
frantically trying to cram old exam questions in my head for those six weeks. Okay. Encouraged confidence and critical thinking. I wonder if it's worth ex explaining a little bit about the structure. So like, I studied biology. There were about 100 kids in my year for biology. Jesus College, which had kids from all different degrees, had five biology students in my year. So I don't, I don't want to get into that. I don't need to. Mm -mm -mm. Eight plus eight plus eight is twenty-four. Twenty-four times three is seventy-two. No. Yes. All right. I'll do one more, and then I'll stop for questions.
Is it? I think, yeah. Is it called? I think it was not week, but we called it zeroth week. No, sorry, it was written like that. Not. No, not the naughty week. Not week. Remember, it was so weird. Everyone had really specific preferences about like what their favorite libraries were to revise in, and people thought about um, seats to get seats in the rad cam. There were very strict rules about like if you were allowed to leave stuff to save a spot, or if you had to clear everything out at the end of the day to allow other people in. Gosh, really fun times. It's all coming back to me. That was I graduated. Wow, five years ago. That's a long old time. Okay, has to be special with everything. Even our terms have special names. The term, Michaelmas, Hillary, and Trinity. Is Noth a word? I No, I didn't make that up. Noth, weak. Okay, I'm not wrong. Um, folks were prone to the fifth week blues when you were exhausted from five weeks of academic rigor but still had a long way to go
Okay, pause for questions. If you've got questions, pop them in the chat. Uh, what study did I subject? Oh my God, my words. What subject did I study at Oxford? Biological sciences, very fun. What publication brings me most of my earnings? Probably Mind Cafe. I've had a couple of really big ones in there. So Mind Cafe. Um, should it be where I learned to write instead of where I learned the right? Yes, I think I fixed that. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. At Oxford, my first year, very cool. Um, I think I've said, I probably won't say it again because I want to at least try to retain some anonymity, um, but I would love to hear what college you went to. Uh, um, Christchurch, oh, that was considered the very posh one. One of my friends went to Christchurch um, and they 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 were from, they were like, um, they went to a state school and everyone else there was like, very posh and they so they felt a little bit i think uncomfortable and out of place not out of place they had friends there but like apparently everyone there was posh i would love to hear if uh that was your experience also uh um all right back in back in college parents we're gonna do two and then pause for a break incest was wincest Is that too dodgy to use as a subtitle? Maybe a little. Not gonna use that. Don't wanna joke about incest. College parents. Okay, how about this? Uh, you were expected to fall in love with your college parents. Hmm. Okay. I don't know if I should put the incest is wincest thing. I find it very funny, but also kind of inappropriate. Okay, I'm not gonna put it in, we're gonna move on.
Uh, no, it was Wadham. Not Worcester. Okay, time for questions, if there are any. Uh, well, any questions? I don't think there are any questions unless it's being slow. So if you have any, pop in and I'll answer them. Um, I don't know if that's your username for YouTube or your actual name, but um, I have heard Christchurch is supposed to be quite good for rowing. Um, sorry to hear about the lockdown. I totally forgot that was happening, to be honest. And after my experience at Oxford, I had such a good time being in person and I oh it sucks so much that this is having to happen i'm sorry hopefully things will get back to normal soon and you can enjoy rowing um oh the even the rowing had funny names there was um oh god what were the races called you had the you had the christchurch regatta in michaelmas that was where the novices rode then there was oh what was it called the one in hillary there was a special name for it and you would, the the racing was so funny because you had to like bump the person in front of you so you got bumped. And if you got bumped on all of your races, you got a spoon. But if you beat other people, you got a blade. This probably makes no sense to people who didn't go to Oxford, but um, that was such a fun time in my life. And you got to drink Pims. Oh, good times. All right, back to, back to writing. Getting trashed did not mean getting drunk well it kind of did but there were multiple meanings oh the bumps thank you that's what it was called bumps race that's the one that happens in hillary what's and then there's one that happens in trinity ahead of the river maybe i forget what it's called anyway i rode for two years you'd never know it to hear me forget what they're all called um oxford 
getting trashed was a very specific and fun ritual everyone did at the end of exams. Everyone does. I guess it's still happening. Like with many other traditions, each college had its own spin. At my college, you'd sit in your exams and walk back with your course mates from your college to get trashed in second quad. We walked through the arch and all our friends I'll switch it to an excellent. Sometimes Grammarly has very funny opinions. I have a really good picture of myself getting trapped after second year exams um, where my now husband actually threw the water at me in such a way that caused me to slip and fall right on my ass, uh, which I, you know, people back home looked at the picture and were like, isn't that your boyfriend? And I was like, well, yeah, that's, this is how he demonstrates his affection for me by dowsing me in water when I finish my exams. It's just, it's just what we do here. You wouldn't understand. It's pretty fun. Uh, I'll have to go through my Facebook to find that picture. Eight. You would punt on the ISIS. The ISIS. Oxford. I wonder if it was the same, like the branch of the Thames. I think it was considered like just an offshoot. I have to look it up. Isis Oxford. River. Yeah, it's an alternate. Knew it. Torpids! Oh, thank you. I just remembered. How did I forget? I think I've blocked it out of my memory because I hated rowing so much. You were only... The reason I hated rowing in case... It was a fun exercise. Like, I enjoyed the exercise, but... Um, for rowing, you had to... You were only allowed to row at very specific times because otherwise... The river was full of like actual boats trying to get from point A to point B. So you had the river, colleges had the river from like stupid AM to slightly less stupid AM. So you'd, you'd get up at like 530, cycle in the pitch black and pitch, pitch cold or whatever to your river where you'd, you know, have to lift this enormous heavy boat onto the freezing water. Your fingers would fall off in the cold and then you'd have to row. And the rowing was quite fun. And especially if the weather was nice, it was beautiful. Lovely, lovely time rowing on the water. 
Um, but then you'd have to get off the boat, lift this dripping boat out of the water, very heavy, everyone's slightly different heights too. So you were like wobbling all over the place, trying to hold this boat, um, get it back into the boathouse and then cycle your cold ass back home to get a cup of tea, um, just in time to hit lectures at 9 a.m. So I was not a fan for that reason. It was really bad in first year because I was going out like almost every night. Um, so, I'd, you know, I'd go out, get really drunk and then, <laughs> you know, go home, fall asleep and then have my alarm go off at like 530. And I was like, oh, I do not want to be rowing right now. But uh, it's fun to look back on, you know. So who was Isis named after? I feel like it's named after. Oh, it derives from. Temesis. I don't remember hunting. I'm trying to remember what the punt actually looked like. Yeah, so was this like, it looked like this. You pull yourself along. I don't even know if I want to talk about rowing. I think I'm going to skip it mm, and hitting the clock. I think I already discussed that, didn't I? Yep. Okay. There were lots of secret and not so secret societies. Ah, no, how do I remove that? Right. 
right. Uh, questions in case anybody has one. Do, 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 do. Uh, what is my articles amount per month? Is there any golden amount personally? Do I post on weekend days? I am currently aiming for 12 per month. That's three a week. Is there any golden amount for me personally? Not that I have found. Um, on, I've had very good months when I've published 18 articles. I've had very good months when I've published three. It depends on the quality of the work. Um, what I've tried to now actually is I've made myself a little editorial. I don't know if you can see this little editorial calendar where I have an idea of the topic I want to write about. So for me personally, I found um, if I try to do something about writing, something like freelancing, something about like a listicle, um, something about current events, fairly often, then usually one of those or two of those a month will do pretty well and earn me the bulk of my money for that month. Um, so that's that's kind of where my three a week comes from. This is to be published tomorrow and is part of my the fun article that I've permitted myself for the week. Because if I only cranked out listicles and current events, I think I would get washed out pretty quickly. So I let myself do stuff like this too. Hmm. Does this sound a little too bitter? This feels a little bitter. Sorry, I just realized I left the comment up. My bad. Um, I feel like this is a little too bitter, this bit here. Like any ancient university where people are rich on too much free time, the place is lousy with them. Hmm. I'll take this part out, I think. Um... Is it called the club? I don't even remember. Bowling then, yeah. <laughs> the Boris Johnson, David Cameron thing. So that's like the whole vibe that those used to go for. Uh, uh, um. All right, weirdest things about attending Oxford as an American. 
when I uh, spell Michaelmas correctly there. When I first got my letter of acceptance to study at the University of Oxford, I had just finished a physics test and was trying to sneakily check my email. As soon as I saw the words, we are pleased to inform you, I actually dropped my phone and hollered aloud. Miss Peterson, I whisper yelled quietly as I could because other kids were still taking the test. Can I please call my mom in your closet? I just found out I got into Oxford. Sure, she said, a little nonplussed. Oxford, Mississippi? I went to a fairly suburban high school in Georgia where not that many people knew it was a big deal to get into Oxford. I knew it was a big deal, but even I didn't know the weirdness. I was getting myself in. I was about to get myself into. Throughout my three years there, I fell in love, fell into the habit of speaking with a British accent, and fell in the river. It was an amazing, exciting, terrifying, and very strange time in my life, all the more so because I had no idea what to expect. Here are the nine weirdest things I learned after attending the University of Oxford as an American. Number one, you have to sit exams in something called subfusk. I'm pretty sure it's two words, not one. Oxford subfusk. Grammarly is making me doubt myself now. Yeah, it's two words. It's two words. You're wrong, Grammarly. Dismiss. I used to heartily believe in the power of taking important tests in sweatpants, comfortable, breathable, and allow you to hyperventilate very quietly. That was before I took or sat in the local parlance exams at Oxford. Because Oxford is such a weird and old university, it has and frankly meaningless traditions, one of which was being for specific form and gown to exams, principals, collections, and graduation. It was a white top, dark bottoms, and shoes with a black ribbon if you were a woman, or a white bow tie if you were a man. Also had to carry but were not under any circumstances permitted to actually wear a mortar board or soft cap. It was also traditional and considered lucky to pin a carnation to your subfusk. You'd wear white on the first exam, pink on the middle ones, and red on your last one. It was pretty typical to be walking to the exam school to sit your final exam and be serenaded with the shouts of good luck as people saw and recognized that you were on your final march to the exam schools due to the red carnation. It was very unlucky to have to buy your own, so you typically form an agreement with friends to buy each other's carnations for exams. Number two, collections were tests, battles were fees. Oxford was very unusual in that they had three very short terms, eight weeks each. Holidays were quite long, frequently six to eight weeks at a time, with a very long summer holiday. To force students to come back in tip-top academic shape, we were made to sit what were called collections. These were mock exams that would be graded by our tutors. Although these fake exams didn't go towards your final grade, they were taken extremely seriously. My friends thought I was very lucky to have a six week break for Christmas, but they did not see me frantically trying to cram old exam questions in my head for those six weeks. On the complete opposite side of things, at the end of every term, we also had to pay what were called battles. These were the fees for our living accommodations, food, and tuition. We students often thought the two should be switched. You collect the fees and you battle the exams after all. <laughs> we thought we were so witty. <laughs> tutors, number three, tutors encouraged confidence and critical thinking with harsh classes. I'm gonna say tutorials here. People often ask me where I learned to write and the truth is Oxford tutorials did. I shorten that. Although we all attended the same lectures as the rest of our course mates, every college had a tutor for your specific subject. Every week during those eight-week terms, our tutors set us a question they'd pick out. We'd spend the week researching, thinking, analyzing, reading, and finally writing a 2,000-word essay on the subject. That was the easy part. Then we'd submit our essay to the tutors. The next day, we'd all gather in a tutorial with a tutor and three to four other students who'd done the same assignment. The tutor would proceed to rip our shoddy essays to shreds as we tried haplessly to defend them. This was very intimidating because tutors were typically academics at the height of their academic career, veritable experts. At the, let's change that. At the top of their ch chosen field of research. 
veritable experts in the, what they were asking you about. I, meanwhile, was a snotty 18-year-old who didn't know the first thing about academic research. However, about, after writing about 72 of these over three years, it taught me to write quickly, write well, and write critically. Number four, Oxford terms are named Michaelmas, Hillary, and Trinity. Because Oxford has to be special with everything, even our terms have special names. The term from Oxford to December was Michaelmas, then Hillary, it's not was, it still is, isn't it? Then Hillary is January through March, and finally Trinity wrapped up our academic year, wrapped our academic year up from April to June. Because terms were short, each week had its own flavor to us. You were never halfway through the term, you were in fourth week. Ninth week was when the best parties typically were, when everyone was back from Everyone was back from vacation. I want to change my other, I want to change holiday to vacation. Everyone was back from vacation, but before going into real work. If you just arrived, it was minus first week, the week before the week before academic work begins, which is first week. Folks were prone to the fifth week blues when you were exhausted from five weeks of academic rigor, but still had a long way to go. Even the breaks were called something special, vacation instead of holiday. This was because the expectation was that you'd vacate the premises, but continue to work hard, hence it was not considered a holiday. Number five, you are expected to fall in love with your college parents. Like American colleges, Oxford has a system to ensure incoming freshmen, freshers, are not cast totally adrift upon arrival. Every fresher was usually given to college parents. There's a whole culture around proposing to your college spouse, who is usually a friend. I married my college spouse. Uh, my college spouse proposed to me in a club with a ring pop. Is it called a ring pop or a pop ring? With a candy ring. Around midnight. Wednesday of Knock Week, for instance. We had an amicable divorce and spousal swap in second year, but I have no regrets. Like many Oxford students, I actually fell in love with my college dad. Most of these relationships didn't last long, but ours did, and we are now married. You basically get sorted into a college like Harry Potter. When I applied to the University of Oxford, I didn't realize you actually had to apply to a specific college at the university. Totally unbeknownst to me at the time, each college has a very specific flavor and reputation. Wadham was the state school college. Jesus was the Welsh college. Christchurch was the posh college. I picked Balliol purely because I liked the sound of the name, but I was pulled to a different college. I like to think it chose me. I had a very happy three years there. The names were pretty meaningless. For example, you had New College, which was actually one of the oldest. Maudlin College, Trinity College, Jesus College, Christchurch College, and so on didn't often have anything to do with religion. Unfortunately for tourists, there's also a university college called Univ by the locals. This causes no end of confusion when you arrive at Oxford and are trying to find the university, not realizing the entire town is the university. I wanna be consistent with my capitalization. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, you know, if college porters have to explain this to a lot of tourists. Number seven, getting trashed did not mean getting drunk. Well, it kind of did, but there were multiple meetings. At Oxford, getting trashed was a very specific and fun ritual. Everyone does, I'm all over the place with my tenses. It is a very specific and fun ritual. Everyone does at the end of exams. Like with many other traditions, each college had its own spin. At my college, you'd sit your exams and walk back with your course mates from college, from your college, with your college course mates. We get trashed in second quad. We walked through the arch and all our friends gathered on the grass to douse us in water with buckets. After we'd be given a bottle of cheap bubbly purchased and shaken up by a friend. The aim was to pop the bottle in such a way that the cork hit the big clock face on the quad. If you did, local legend had it, you'd secured yourself a first, which was considered an excellent grade. Other colleges would trash their students at the exam schools with glitter, silly string yards, and so on. Number eight, you would punt on the Isis. The Isis was the Oxford branch of the Thames, derived from the Middle English name for the Thames, the Thamesis. During Trinity term, colleges would permit you to book out their punts, which were spindly, squarish boats, and go punting on the river. 
Punting involved a punter standing up on the end of the boat and pulling the river along. It was typical to bring fruits, snacks, and of course, pins. Understandably, punting was very precarious. It was not unheard of for punts to flip and have to be dredged from the bottom of the ices. And if you, like me, went punting after your exams, also after having a celebratory bottle of champagne and thought yourself ready enough, steady enough to punt, you'd find yourself sorely mistaken and also in the river. Luckily on this occasion, it was sunny enough that I was able to change out of my sub fusk and dry off pretty quickly. Number nine, there were lots of secret and not so secret societies. At the end of my first year, I received a mysterious note in my pitch, short for pigeonhole, and where students received all their mail. It invited me to an even more mysterious event held at a mysterious locale. I was to come dressed in a mysterious costume. This was my first experience with secret societies at Oxford. Like any ancient university where people are rich and have too much free time, the place is lousy with them. They were mostly men only ones as women were only relatively recently permitted at Oxford and a lot of those were aimed at folks who came from money. And a lot of those societies were aimed at folks who came from money. While my secret society was a fairly open secret at the college, there were some that were extremely quiet that I only ever heard rumors about, as well as some of that, those that were notorious, like the Bullington Club. And of course, I'm sure there were plenty I never heard about at all. All right, I'm going to wrap it up with a conclusion. Before I do that, I will hop on over to the questions, if there are any. Suli, what is your favorite article read length? Um, I like the really long ones, actually. I like to really dive in and sort of lose myself in an article. So I prefer reading ones that are like eight plus minutes long. Um, I prefer writing ones that are between four to six. I think this one's probably gonna be a bit longer than that. Let's see. Yeah, this one's probably gonna be nine minutes. Um, oh, another from Ola. Will I see a change once I hit 2K followers? Do I need 10K to see influence changes? I didn't notice anything specific from zero to 10. 10,000 was where I really noticed uh, a, fairly, a fairly noticeable change in my distribution. Um, did I write somewhere online before starting with Medium? I did. I had a couple failed blogs. I maybe wrote like one or two blog posts for each one. I don't even remember what they were called. I'm trying to think, but no, it's gone. Um, this is the first place I've written more than three articles in a row. Um, don't you think this article is a little longer read? Will it make revenue? Will it make it as far as revenue is concerned? Probably not. Um, I'm not expecting this to get a lot of traffic, to be honest with you. I don't think it's going to make a lot of money. The ones that make a lot of money are typically the ones that are listicles, that are this psychological hack, that are very trendy, very like, um, I don't even remember. This, I'm not writing for money. I'm not writing it for reads. I'm writing this because I have to give myself something fun to write about. Otherwise, I would stop writing. So this was all just like, just fun. This is, it was fun for me to reminisce. I thought it'd be a good one to do with like people who are live so I can like reminisce together. It's cool that there's actually someone at Oxford. I don't know if he's still here, but who's here as well. So that was a fun coincidence. Um, but yeah, that's just my fun. Oh, the short answer to your question. Yeah, probably too long for people to really get interested in. Probably won't make a lot of revenue, but you win some, you lose some. Uh, what changed after 10K followers? So for me, I didn't notice anything on all of my articles, but that was when I started going viral. Um, so by viral, I mean that I would frequently get more than 20 or 30,000 views on some of my stories. Some of my stories still don't take off. Many of them have only a couple hundred views. That's fine. I have, um, I can count, count, Usually I get about one every month, one every other month or so that does really, really well. Um, that's where a lot of my money comes from. Uh, because I'm in India, I cannot be a part of the partner program. Is there any way around this? I get this question a lot and I wish I had a better answer than what I'm about to tell you. So first of all, I have heard that there is a way to do this. You can sign up to TransferWise or Payoneer. I'm not speaking with any expertise. I have not done this myself. This is just kind of hearsay. I've heard that you can effectively set up a, a, a virtual bank account that appears to be based in a country like the US that is supported by Stripe. Um, I think there is, you have to pay tax cuts or there's some kind of fee for that, um, that unless you're making a good deal of money on Medium already, isn't super worth it. But again, no experience. I can't, I don't know for sure. That's as far as I've got. My slightly longer answer, is that it is unfair, it sucks. I think Medium and Stripe are making a big mistake because they're effectively excluding a large part of the population that is probably good at writing, but right now can't be compensated for it. 
That being said, a lot of the most popular writers on Medium today, Todd Bryson, who I interviewed a couple weeks ago, Nick Goka, um, uh, Shanta Grimes, they all started writing before Medium was monetized for anybody. They wrote, they kept writing, they wrote for fun, they wrote to build their base, they wrote to um, find engagement, to find readers. Today, they're doing phenomenally well because they kept going and now it's monetized. They, But they, by the time it was monetized, they already had consistent readers. They already had a backlog. So what I recommend is, I, I wish you didn't have to do this because I think it's unfair that I can make money just by royalties and that you don't get to, but there's, there's nothing wrong with writing without making money other than that it sucks that you're not being compensated. You can write to drive traffic to your blog. You can use affiliate links. Um, you can use it just to start building a portfolio to start getting freelance work. And hopefully India will soon be monetized along with all the other countries that should be. And at that point, if you've been writing all along, you will be so much more established than the hundred other writers who come on board only then when it's monetized. So that's, that's my advice. It's not a perfect situation. I wish that I had a better answer, um, but that's what I tend to recommend right now. Um, oh, follow up question. Uh, any chances of getting my stories picked by the publications without being in the program? Good news is you don't need to be in the program. Um, you, the publications don't make any money off you anyway. I don't actually know how they make money. I guess, I guess you grow the publication and then if you're the owner, you can also promote your own stories and get money that way, but I'm not really sure. Um, so you shouldn't need to be part of the partner program. You should be able to get into the pubs just on the virtue of your own writing, your own backlog, the story that you're putting in front of them right now. All right, conclusion time. Then I'm going to go get uh, another hot beverage because my throat is very sore. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. What other weird stuff did I did? I normally I normally write self-help I normally write stuff that I get to the end of it and I'm like okay you finished reading the story this is your takeaway I don't really have that for this like I'm just writing this because I, I wanted to share my life stories uh, okay I can't give a takeaway for a reader but I can like I can say what my takeaway was after all this which was um,
of a boring takeaway. Is that too cheesy? All right, we're gonna just read the conclusion and then I will seriously call it a day. These nine bizarre Oxford traditions and trades are only the tip of the iceberg. I could write a book about the rowing subculture, the college bobs, the covered market, the various sandwich shops and my memories there. I consider myself very fortunate to have experienced a very eventful, incredibly fortunate to have experienced a very eventful three years there that have provided me with a wealth of knowledge, anecdotes and friendships. Heartwarming. There wasn't really a takeaway for this article. It was just intended to let any reader mentally travel to Oxford University for just a few minutes. What I learned from my three years there is that Oxford isn't unique in that it's unique. Every place has its traditions and habits if you're willing to look. Oxford shattered my preconceived notions of what, it, what I thought it meant to go to Oxford. In every place I've lived after, I've done my best to try and experience it to the fullest and enjoy as much of it as I could and come to it. If nothing else, else I have learned to come any new situation with an open mind and an open heart. Ready for what I can learn. Okay, it's a little preachy, but whatever. Um, okay, time to workshop the title into something a little bit more. The nine weirdest things of, of about University of Oxford as an American. Nine major things I experienced while attending the University of Oxford from the perspective of a sheltered American. Yeah, all right, not bad. I might, I'm gonna sleep on this and publish it tomorrow um, in my own pub, uh, Zuli writes, because as I said, I don't really think anybody is that interested in this story. Other than <laughs> um, look, well, I mean, I don't even know. That's probably the only thing. Uh, culture. Cities. Travel. And the publication. And then, because I'm the editor, I can now go into here and schedule it for tomorrow. Let's go for 9 a.m. 9.05, why not? Um, I'll come in here before and... Wait, what the heck, why isn't the... It's saved, it should be, should be updating. I'll just have to do this manually. Oops. I'll come in later today and put in all the pictures, etc. All right. Oh, wait, no, hang on. No, stop. No, that's not what I wanted. Why wouldn't you have done tomorrow? At 
8.20 a.m. Save changes. I hope it's not, it's not already gone. Okay, phew. Gosh, I really thought it was going to go today. All right. Whew, that's it. Thank you all for coming here. If you wrote something and it gets published, please put it in the comments. I would love to read it. If you're watching this on replay, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, like I said, planning on doing these every Sunday because this is fun for me and I hope it's fun for you too. And I look forward to seeing you all next week.